after the congregation has communed and given thanks, they are blessed and sent. The priest says, go forth, the Mass is ended. It's been said that after the words of consecration, these are the most sacred words of the entire Mass. Now that the people have gathered as one family, heard the word of God, professed their faith, prayed for one another, offered sacrifice to the Father, and received the body and blood of Jesus, they are, at least in principle, more properly formed, and hence ready to go out to effect the transformation of the world. In his meditations on the story of the visit of the Magi, Fulton Sheen indicated that the three kings, having traversed a great distance, having withstood opposition from King Herod, having found the baby, having opened their treasures for him, and finally having been warned by an angel, went home by a different route. Of course they did, he concluded, for no one comes to Christ and goes back the same way he came. The liturgy is the privileged communion with the Lord. It is the source and summit of the Christian life. And therefore, those who participate in it never leave unchanged, never go back the same way they came. Okay, somebody get the lights, please. I think we ought to get some of those flags. What do you think? Wow, that is some of the best teaching on the Mass you will ever hear. And then to have the video behind all of that, and look at all these different churches and different cathedrals. The one in Orvieto then talks about where it had, they have the corporal stained with blood. Jackie and I were there three years ago. We didn't get near as close to that thing as he did. I think he's got like a privileged priest pass or some kind of deal. Wow. Every time I hear this part of Catholicism, it brings back so clearly to Jackie and I why we're Catholics today. It's so powerful. So last week, we spent time at the beginning of the Mass. We looked at the Liturgy of the Word. This week, we begin the Liturgy of the Eucharist, and he starts with the offering. Bishop tells us at this very point in the Mass, we are about to experience an encounter. And even in human terms, an encounter normally means you meet with someone and you talk with them, and if you're really going to get to know them, most of the time you sit down to a what? Meal. To a meal. And so, when the Mass begins, there is this conversation going on between God and us. God speaks His Word to us through the lecture, and we respond to that. We're, we're conversing with God Himself. We are talking with each other. And yes, it is a conversation with Jesus. Even if We may not recognize that, but that's what it is. Christ our Lord, Jesus is not only the... Now listen to what I'm saying. Jesus is not only the host of the meal welcoming us to the banqueting table. He's also the meal itself. How many of you have been the host of a meal? How many of you have been the meal itself? <laughs> well, there are a couple of all the seatings that yeah, I felt like I brought. And we'll hear about those later, David. Thank you very much. He presents us with a living sack. <laughs> The word, the key word here is living sac. It's not a dead sacrifice. All the Old Testament sacrifices that were offered to God were what? Dead. Jesus brings to the Mass a living sacrifice. He offers Himself for us to take into our own bodies and be strengthened and nourished. 
Bishop makes this statement. I had to think about this quite a bit. In fact, Bishop makes a lot of statements that I have to think about quite a bit. In a world gone wrong, there is no communion without sacrifice. In a world gone wrong, there is no communion without sacrifice. And I thought about this for quite a while. What's he telling us? And then it dawned on me this. In a perfect world, no sacrifice is needed. Communion between all of us and God would be perfect, just like it was in the garden before the fall of man. Right? There's no sacrifice needed. But when the world goes south, when sin enters the world, and we're twisted out of shape to the point that we're separated from God, then a sacrifice must take place for that communion to be restored. That's so important for us to understand. Sin twisted our relationship with God out of shape to the point that fallen man was only centered on himself. He was self-centered. Selfish. True worship, entering once again into intimate communion with God, required a painful twisting back into shape as we approach God. Those are important words to understand. And it will require some sort of sacrifice. In animal sacrifice, man was taking one small aspect of God's creation and returning it to the source, which is God. How? By the shedding of blood. That's the old covenant. Over and over and over. How, million, how many millions of animals were sacrificed to cover the sin of mankind? Over and over. They tell me that <clears throat> in ancient days you could smell the temple long before you could get there. Wow. Because of all the blood that had been shed for the sins of all those people. That was an act of man showing to God, here I've sacrificed this innocent animal to cover my sin because God, I thank you for my life. I thank you that you give me the forgiveness of sins. Yes. Juanita. So on earth, we will never have a perfect sacrifice. Is that right? I would say that's yes. That is right. It's always going to be a sacrifice. As far as our sacrifice. In other words, when we come to Mass, what sacrifice do we bring? We bring ourselves. And I don't think any of us could say, oh, I finally got a perfect sacrifice. Everything's kosher. We're really good now. End of story. No. Now, the sacrifice that Jesus made and that He brings to the Mass, that's perfect. His sacrifice. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a difference between what we sacrifice at the Mass, which is ourselves. But we will never have a perfect sacrifice on earth. That's right. What about the saints? Do they have a perfect sacrifice? No, but they are, of course, they're experiencing that now. Uh -huh. and, and quite frankly, I, I don't want to say a flat no. So our sacrifice is our sin, is that right? Ourselves. Ourselves. We are bringing, we're, we're asking God to forgive us our sins. And the only sacrifice we have to bring to the Mass is, Lord, I give you myself. Change me. Empower me. Send me. Use me. That's our sacrifice. But it's done under a perfect sacrifice. So our sacrifice is imperfect. We're doing the best we can to give it to God. But it's covered by a perfect blood. A living blood of Christ. So there's some real nuance in there. So to say we can never give a perfect sacrifice, that's basically true. Can I say that the saints never gave a perfect sacrifice? I don't know that I can say that. Boy, we get into some stuff. Isn't this fun? <laughs> it's fun. Praise God. We are the ones that need sacrifice. God doesn't need sacrifice. Why doesn't God need sacrifice? What would He need sacrifice for? So, if God is at the Mass and we're at the Mass, who's the ones that need sacrifice? We do. 
We need to sacrifice. We are the ones that need change in our sinful lives to restore communion with God in our twisted, disordered lives. Amen. Sacrifice produces communion. He said that flat out. And I agree. Sacrifice produces communion. Every time I give myself in a sacrificial way to my wife because I love her, I want to help her, I want to show love to her in many as many ways as I can, that's a sacrifice on my part. It's because I love her. It is producing communion between us. And she's doing the same. Do you know how many things Jackie has had to do since I've been in AFIP since January? <laughs> Can't count that high. She's about to get wore out. She's as impatient about this as, well, not, as, not quite as much <laughs> as I am. But her sacrifice is unbelievable. Wow. As this part of the Mass begins the offering, small amounts, the small amounts of bread and wine and water are brought forward to the priest to be offered in the Mass. Bread and wine represent wheat and the fruit of the vine, also bringing to mind earth, water, wind, sunshine, all the elements of the cosmos, the entire creation of God. That's what's represented by this meager offering that goes forward to the priest. Then the priest speaks these amazing words. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread and the wine we offer you. Does that sound familiar? Wow. You know, when you read those words again, those are beautiful words. Those are powerful words. Acknowledging our offering to the Lord. We offer the bread and wine to the, our Father God, who does not need them. He in turn blesses them, and He elevates them to the highest level. How? Transforming simple bread and wine into the body and the blood of Christ Himself. Woo! Sorry, I got a little charismatic there. Praise God! If you have any questions about the Mass on earth being joined to heavenly liturgy, the holy, holy, holy should be clear and resounding answer to that question. Because we actually say we join our voices with angels in our cages. And at that moment, time begins to collapse. And the veil between heaven and earth is pulled back. And there's the heavenly host singing with us. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. What a powerful moment. And yet the best is yet to come. We are in this eternal moment giving God all the glory. None of the glory comes to us or anyone else. To God be the glory. Forever and ever and ever. Amen. And right after we sing that, the priest reinforces those words even more. You are indeed holy, O Lord. And all that you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, you give life. Boy, I love it. You almost have to say it that way. You give life to all things and make them holy. Then what happens? The priest then places his hands over the bread and the wine and implores the Holy Spirit to descend on this simple bread and wine and transform them into the body and the blood of Jesus. Wow. Therefore, our Lord, O oh Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make these make holy these gifts we have brought to you for our for consecration, that they may become the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love the Mass. I love the words of the Mass. I love what happens in the Mass. 
The priest then begins to speak what's known as the institution narrative or institutional narrative. Recalling from the Gospels that Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. But now he dramatically moves from the third person context to first person, quoting directly from sacred scripture the very words of Jesus. And this is when he bends over and repeats exactly what Jesus said. Take this, all of you, and eat. You notice, they slow down. When the priest says this, they slow down. Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given for you. Then the priest picks up the cup of wine, now transformed into the body and into the blood of Christ, again speaking in third person, describing how Jesus took the chalice of wine and gave thanks, and again, once again, the exact words of Jesus. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. The heart of our Catholic faith tells us now, at this moment, that Jesus has in these very moments become truly and substantially present to his people through the transformation of bread and wine into Jesus' body, blood, soul, soul, <laughs> and divinity. I don't know what you call that. I call it a miracle. Mr. Ron. I often wondered when the exact moment was that they converted. And I got, I teach out of the prison, and we were teaching this there. And the, uh, what we were using uh, was a video, and the video said, as soon as the priest says, this is, is my, my body. body. Yes. And that's the, the words of consecration. Conversion, yeah. yeah. This is my blood. Yes. So that, that's the exact meaning. Yes. Blood and blood. Yeah. Tim, um, I believe that the priest actually becomes an altar Christ at that very moment. He is in the person of Christ in that very moment. He is not only now the host of the meal, he is the meal. Oh, oh, oh. Uh -huh. I've never been a Protestant church that could say that. <laughs> They had some pretty good church meals after Sunday. <laughs> some of their potlucks were really, really good, but it doesn't hold a candle to the Eucharist. It does not. It does not. It does not. I love them, but it does not. Then Bishop, the way Bishop does things, he takes us to Capernaum, the city where the events of the Gospel of John chapter 6 take place. For Catholics, this is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. And the chapter begins with Jesus feeding 5,000 with five barley loaves and two fish. And the multitude was so moved by this great miracle, Jesus could see that they were going to take him by force and make him a king. So what does he do? He withdraws where they could not find him. Later, his disciples got on a boat headed to Capernaum across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus followed them walking on the Sea of Galilee. And this is one of my favorite verses from John 6.21. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. <laughs> First of all, they're scared to death. Who's this guy walking on the sea? It's Jesus. Get him in the boat. And then they were immediately at, the, at where they, their destination was. Mm -hmm. The crowd found him the next day across the Sea of Galilee and they came <coughs> seeking more miraculous signs. But Jesus begins a discourse that is very hard for them to believe. Very hard for them to hear. Are there Kleenexes back there? Mm -hmm. Oh, here you go. 
My nose is running over. Thank you, sir. Jesus told them to seek Him, Him, as the bread of life. Not miraculous bread made from barley. He told them that He was the bread come down from heaven. The only bread that could satisfy the longing of their soul. And here's where the sparks begin to fly. And if, if Protestants read John chapter 6, today the sparks begin to fly. I am the bread of life. This is verse 48. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Well, if they don't believe in the real presence, how do they explain this to people? Protestants. It's all symbolic. It's all symbolic. It's not, this is not, this is, it's so interesting to me. So many of my Protestant brothers that I love dearly take so much of the Bible literally, except John chapter 6. <laughs> so this is just supposed to make sense. They can believe in a seven day creation. But this, no. No. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness and they died. I am the bread of life. How can this... And, the, and then the Jews began to dispute among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And it just... This is the beginning of a big row. These words so offended the Jews that are present in that crowd. They've been told since childhood that eating the flesh of a man was evil. They were confused and offended. Throughout the Old Testament, various commands not to eat the flesh of animals with the blood still in it. And here is this human being saying that he was the bread come down from heaven and they must eat his flesh and drink his blood. I mean, I can see him covering their ears. Yeah. Yes. Well... I may be kind of jumping ahead here, but one of the things, the criticisms that non-Catholics have is that Catholics are cannibals. However, cannibals eat dead people. And we, do, we are eating them. And I have shared that with my Protestant friends and it doesn't help. They're still struggling. But you're exactly right. We're not eating dead flesh at a mass. The living and eternal sacrifice. Ron, I'm going to have to hurry because you have to get through this. I always ask them, you know, when they say that it's just a symbol, I always ask them, well, what part of this is my body? <laughs> Don't you understand? Exactly. <laughs> what part is it? Is, is this ambiguous or what? Exactly. This is the perfect time. Listen to me. And here's another really good Understanding for our Protestant brothers that I love very dearly. This was the perfect time for Jesus to correct himself if his words were not to be taken literally, but instead symbolic. But he didn't. He doubled down. Listen to what he says. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Is there any words in there about symbolic? No, no, no. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am in Jesus isn't backing off. He's doubling and tripling down. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, symbolically, no, 
will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. When the crowd objects to the physical realism of what Jesus is saying, Jesus intensifies it even more. And this is something I did not realize, and I still got to kind of think through this. The word he used for eating his flesh was not the normal word for humans eating flesh. The word Jesus used was the one describing the way animals gnaw flesh while they're eating. You ever heard that before? Yeah, he said it. <laughs> I think that means that you're so hungry. You're so hungry! Don't get between me and a spare rib if I'm really hungry. But in a very real way, can we approach Mass so we're so hungry for the things of God, for hungry for everything Jesus has for us? No, at my flesh. Wow. In one 24 hour day, Scores of his disciples in that crowd went from wanting to make Jesus king to now turning their backs on him and never following him again. And it is interesting to me, and I said this before, many Protestants have proudly take the Bible literally, except for John chapter 6. It still amazes me. And why? it's still separating Christians today. Yes, Rob. Is that why, uh, what was his name? Martin Luther wanted to get rid of John? He didn't want to get rid of the Gospel of John. He wanted to get rid of Revelations. He wanted to get rid of James. Oh, I thought he wanted in fact, he John. still believed in the real presence of Jesus his entire life. But once he opened the door to something other than that, that's when it began to get watered down. Yes. Okay. My fault. Well, I... Remember in my Protestant days when I was challenged by apostolic succession, and one of the problems after the Reformation was they lost the ability to ordain those who could say the mass validly, and so they had to make it into something symbolic rather than literal exactly. because they lost their apostolic. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Tim, can you explain, like, I've been told some of the Lutherans, especially the Missouri Synod, believe that they can act, they actually have the presence for a short period of time or whatever, and then it... They, they believe in something called consubstantial instead of transubstantiation. They believe in consubstantiation. We're going to talk about that in just a minute, okay? okay? So, here we go, and there, he, and then now all these disciples, I see it, thank you, John. All these disciples have turned their back. They're gone. They've left it. And Jesus turns around to his disciples and says what? Will you go also away? Are you going to leave me also? Simon Peter. He may have been a mess. But thank God he was the first pope. Woo. Simon Peter. Lord... To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Bishop takes us to the cathedral at Orvieto. And Jackie and I were there three years ago. I could have sat across from this church and it's only showing it. You should see it way up close. I could have sat across from that and just looked at the front of that church all day long. And I never would have taken it all in. But it talks about this priest who was a doubter and who was, he was on a pilgrimage to Rome and he stopped by a, a, the tiny village of Bolsena and he was doing Mass. And when he held up the host, the blood came out of that host and his onto his hands, down his arms, under the corporal. And he immediately went to Orvieto because that's where the Pope was, Urban IV. 
And he begged for forgiveness. And threw himself on the mercy of the church. And when the Pope found out what happened, he sent a delegation to Bolsino immediately to get that corporal. And it's in that cathedral to this very day. It's incredible. The stains of Jesus' blood are on that corporal. Oh my word. What a beautiful, beautiful story. And then guess who was there to read? <laughs> Urban IV uh, created a new feast called Corpus Christi. How many have heard of that one? <laughs> From this miracle. And guess who was there to write the songs and the hymns? <coughs> Thomas Aquinas. How many know timing is everything? <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Wow, my voice changed. Isn't that incredible? Yes. Yes. Now let's talk about transubstantiation. <coughs> what really helped me understand transubstantiation, because I struggle with words like accidents and substance. And Bishop Barron said, no, think of it in this way, reality and appearance. So at the moment of consecration, the deepest reality of the bread and wine is changed into the body and blood of Christ. But the appearance does not change. So what does consubstantiation mean? Transubstantiation means once it's transformed, it will never change back ever once God blesses it transformed it and that's why we take care of the leftover hosts and we consume the leftover blood right because that's what it is well there are churches the Anglicans have this the Lutherans have this where they call it consubstantiation where the body and or the spirit of Christ and the, the Spirit of Christ is with the bread and the wine for a period of time. And at the Eucharist, that, that Spirit lifts and it's no longer. See, I, I just, I rejected that from the time I heard it. I said, no, 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 no. In fact, I'm the one that was driving back to our little church in Newton, and I'm looking at Jackie saying, we need a tabernacle. She said, what? I said, we need a tabernacle. We can't keep putting Jesus on the shelf. <laughs> Which is what we were doing. We'd get done and then we'd collect the hosts that weren't used. And then, so we can't, we're putting Jesus on a shelf. We can't do that. <laughs> and that, that's when I looked at Jackie. I said, we're going to be Catholic. <laughs> I mean, that's what that is. Isn't that Catholic? Yeah. It is Catholic. So that's the difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation. Does that make sense? Yes. Isn't it also true with consubstantiation that they say Jesus is really present if you believe he is? There is some of that. It's all over the board, quite frankly. It's, yeah, there is some of that. And quite frankly, I know some Anglicans that are so close to being Catholic, they might as well step over. They're leaning over the line. They really are. <laughs> and one of the things that I loved about reality and appearance, when we look up in the sky at night, we're looking at stars that used to be there. Not the ones that are there, because in some of the lights that we're looking at took millions of years to get to us. And so some of those stars that we think are there are long gone. Right? And he's right. We look at the sun and it looks like it's going across the sky. But it isn't. Now, if I come up to you at a party and I'm going to try to say this real quick and I say, Hey, Bill, how you doing? You're under arrest. You're going to, you're going to laugh at me. Why? Because I'm not a deputy. I'm not a... My words don't mean anything. But... If Billy Bob has <laughs> double parked and he's in front of a fire hydrant and a guy in blue with a badge steps into our party says, Mr. Bill, may I speak with you? 
you're under arrest. The words of that officer have changed reality. I didn't change reality, but he did. And if we can do that with puny human words, what about the God who spoke creation into existence? Let there be light, and there was light. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Little girl, rise up. And the dead girl rose up. This is my body. Don't you dare tell me it's not. Those are the words of Jesus. This is my blood. And it is. And that's all there is to it. You either believe it or you don't. And unfortunately, we got too many Catholics that are not believing it or not understanding it at the very least. This wears me out because I get so excited about, I'm Catholic, I'm Catholic, I'm ca I made it, I made it, I made it, I made it. Praise God, yes. As I told you once before, we need to be careful what we believe and what we don't believe. Because whether we believe something or don't believe, it doesn't change reality. We can believe that Fourth Street out here, as I said, would be and take off going 80 miles an hour down it. You can't do or we can believe I-70 is Fourth Street and play basketball on it, and we're going to end up with uh, terrible results for what? Exactly. Just out of our belief or lack of belief. We are living in a world where truth has become relative. And we as Catholics believe in objective truth. Truth that is truth. Oh, I love this. And then, of course, the end of the Mass, we get this wonderful blessing and we're sent forth. Go forth, the Mass has ended. In other words, go change your world. You've been fed by Christ Himself. The body, the living body and blood of Jesus. Now it's time for you to take that strength and empowerment that God has given you and that beautiful covering of your sin that happened at the very beginning of the Mass. Go change your world. Isn't that beautiful? Praise God. I tell you, I love seeing my dad get in that B-29. It was wonderful. But I missed you guys. I missed this class. I love what goes on in here. It's just awesome. And thank you for your participation. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord God, we thank you for the Mass. We thank you for your perfect sacrifice. And we thank you, Lord, that you invite us every Mass to the banqueting table, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Bless this day, Lord God. Today is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in this day. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Amen. Bill, you're not under the list, okay? Thank you. <laughs>